1941, the famous storyteller Georges Louis Borges published a story called The Garden of Forking Paths. In it, he imagined a vast, unfinished novel in which every possible pathway unfolded simultaneously. In this video, which is the last in a series of three on cultural evolution, I'm going to explain why Borges' vision, I think, represents a more accurate view of history than a conventional linear narrative structure. To illustrate what I mean, I'm going to look at the evolution of the group of Asian looms that I introduced in the first two videos in this series, beginning with this simple loom from Hainan Island in southern China. As I'll explain, the evolution of these looms challenges our notions of progress and how technology evolves, and even our notions of what history is. The conclusions from looking at the archaeology of these looms and their cultural transmission processes is that they are ancient, diverse, and transmitted very conservatively. So they're worth looking at more closely to see if we can uncover the detailed lineages of these inventions. The two most basic questions that we want to answer are, are these looms really related, and how did they evolve? Weaving traditions and looms are transmitted without the use of the written word, so the expectation here is that we can learn something about how complex technologies evolved in pre-modern societies, and there are some very complex technologies here. The first step in this analysis is to list the characteristics of the looms. The looms are all different, but they share many features in common, such as horizontal orientation, the presence of a warp beam and a cloth beam, and the use of certain tools such as a weft beater. Each of these characteristics is given a code. The next step in the workflow is to create a database where each root loom is represented by a row. There are 86 rows, one for every loom in the study. The characteristics are listed across the top. There are about 450 in all, so this is just a tiny part of the table. In each cell, the characters are, that are present are listed, together with a reference to a photograph or another data source and notes on its identification. The next step is to convert these notes into a matrix that shows the presence or absence of each characteristic, recorded as one or zero, respectively. Armed with this matrix, we can now check to see whether a tree-like evolutionary model is a good one for this set of data. To do this, I'm going to use a phylogenetic analysis using a Bayesian Markov chain Monte Carlo search. This search is for the group of trees that can best reproduce the data. The Bayesian approach is not the only way to look for tree models, but it has the advantage that it can allow characters to vary over time at different rates. This turns out to be important in looms, where some features are stable for long periods, but other features can change relatively rapidly. To root the tree, I'm going to use this loom that I discussed in the first video, the oldest recognizable loom in the region. As I mentioned, the Bayesian analysis yields a group of trees. These can be summarized using a consensus tree which in essence is a phylogenetic model for the evolution of our group of looms. A standard measure of how well a phylogeny such as this reproduces the data is the retention index, which varies in principle between 0 and 1. This tree has a retention index of 0.7, which is quite similar to that for many biological data sets, and suggests that we're not wrong in thinking that these looms are a related group that evolved together. In broad stroke terms, this tree clusters together simple body tension looms without frames in the top part of the tree. Next come a group of looms that are also body tensioned, but have frames. Most of these looms fall into two different clades, shown here in green and orange. Lastly, we have a group of looms with frames that have lost the body tensioning feature. These also fall into several different clades. This group includes Chinese draw looms, of which there are two different types, and a loom called the stepping stone loom. 
The clade for these looms is shown in dark purple. The draw looms are perhaps the most famous of all looms from this region, and are also some of the most complex. This kind of analysis is tremendously powerful, because aside from pro providing us with a model for the evolution of these looms, it also gives us an objective classification system. Classification schemes for looms have been attempted in the past, but these systems have been top-down and based on intuition, which is the way that most classification systems for material culture have been developed until very recently. This includes classifications for objects ranging from stone tools to pots. The problem with top-down intuitive classifications is that they are dependent on the judgment of an individual researcher and, predictably enough, no two researchers can agree on the best system. Ground-up classifications, in contrast, offer something closer to objectivity. In the past, most classifications that have been proposed for looms have focused on the system for opening the warp to insert the weft. But this analysis is telling us that it's the way in which the warp is fixed and tensioned that is the most fundamental feature, and the one that defines the clades on this tree. This is already big progress versus anything we've had before. As a next step, let's check if this is a plausible model of the evolution of our set of looms. If it is realistic, we should be able to reconstruct a set of ancestral states across this tree, and these should preferably be functioning weaving devices. So I'm going to stretch out the tree so that we can see it more clearly. Then I'm going to pick the nodes that I've marked here, representing the main clades. Then I use the Mesquite software to reconstruct the most likely ancestral characters at these points. What I've done here is I've determined the most probable characters at each of these nodes, and then I've sketched a loom at each node using just those characters. All of these turn out to be functioning looms, which means that this tree is at least a workable hypothesis for the development of these devices. So what is this model for loom evolution telling us? The first thing that stands out is that there's a huge disparity in the amount of change that has occurred between these various lineages. The simple looms at the top of this diagram have changed very little over time, something we also saw from looking at archaeological data. In contrast, the looms lower down in the diagram have undergone a great deal of change, adding new characters and losing some old ones. Remarkably, examples of all of these looms have survived to the present day in different parts of Asia, even looms that seem virtually unchanged versus the oldest archaeological remains. This survival of simpler technologies alongside more complex ones turns out to be a characteristic feature of many pre-modern technologies. We're used to the idea that the latest smartphone model, for example, replaces all the previous ones, but this was not the pattern in the past. This cannot be just put down to ignorance or lack of communication between cultures. Many weavers that I spoke to are well aware that their neighbours' looms are different to their own, but they're not interested in copying them. It seems that weaving technology is as much about local circumstances and cultural identity as it is about efficiency. So, we have near stasis in some lineages, compared with astonishing developments in others. This loom, used by Zhuang people in South China, is an example of one of the more complex types. Patterns are recorded permanently on a set of bamboo rods around the drum in the centre, which rotates as the patterns are transferred to the cloth. The loom is used for weaving decorated bed covers such as this one. Generally, these complex looms seem to appear in societies living in relatively prosperous circumstances. The simpler looms are concentrated in smaller scale societies, particularly those living in remote and resource poor locations. When we think of technology, we usually think of progress in the same breath. So does technology progress? Well, in many lineages, it clearly has, but bear in mind that our starting point was the simplest loom. 
and wealthier societies have tended to become more numerous over time. So it's perhaps not surprising that we see complexification in some lineages, but this is clearly not inevitable. In fact, technological stasis seems to be the norm in cultures that have remained stable and small in scale over time, and may in fact be the norm throughout much of human history. The remarkable stability of the Acherlian tool set during the Paleolithic period comes to mind. In contemporary life, we tend to notice things that change, but in fact, many tools that are in daily use have not changed in centuries, sometimes even longer. So looking at the evolution of our set of looms, we can certainly see examples of progress when we look at individual lineages close up. But when we look at the whole picture, it lo looks more like a question of filling available niches. Once a niche is found, a loom may stay stable for thousands of years or for as long as the niche persists. Interestingly, we can also find examples where progress seems to have gone into reverse. For example, one major clade of looms is composed of body tension looms. The ancestral loom at the base of the clade had a frame with four legs and horizontal struts, like this one. But the loom of the Miao people in the Panxian area in South China, which belongs to this clade, has lost both the legs and the horizontal frame members. This seems to be an adaptation to life in an upland region where timber is scarce and space is at a premium. The Panxian Miao loom is less convenient to operate than its ancestral loom, but Panxian weavers still manage to use it to create some rather stunning jackets, such as this one made from hemp and wool. As I said earlier, the strictly tree-like model from the Bayesian search seems to represent loom evolution fairly well, but it isn't the whole story. There are some loom designs that can only be explained if we assume that hybridization has occurred, and there are several examples of this in this data set. I'm going to pick just one of them to talk about here. At some time in the last millennium, weavers in the islands of Sumatra and Java in Indonesia, who were weaving using a simple body tension loom like the one at the top here, encountered a more sophisticated frame loom that was probably brought by migrants coming down the Malay Peninsula. This new loom offered some distinct advantages. It was more suited to weaving fine silk text textiles for commerce than their native loom. They could have copied the entire loom, but instead what they seem to have done is borrowed a couple of features. A reed which controls warp spacing, and the flat warp beam that enables the use of a much longer warp. The result was a hybrid loom, which is still in use in this region today for weaving fine silk Songket textiles, such as this one. There's a wealth of diverse and diverging stories in this family tree of looms, along with many hints and many unanswered questions. The last loom that I want to discuss today is one that I mentioned earlier, the Chinese draw loom. This is an example of relatively rapid technological change, though this is still change that took place over many centuries. The loom's evolution seems to have been driven by a mixture of commercial pressures and imperial patronage. Versions of this loom existed during the Song Dynasty around about the 12th century, and it seems to have arrived in pretty much its present day form by the 15th century. This version of the loom, called the Greater Draw Loom, consists of two parts, a ground weave system operated by the weaver and a patterning system operated by an assistant. The patterning system fully specifies the weave, including the design and the colors. So this is essentially a programmed mechanical device for making full color images in the form of textiles reproducibly. The textiles made on this loom were portable and they were made in quantity, so they had an enormous influence on the decorative arts of Asia and beyond. The ground weave system resembles another loom called the stepping stone loom, which was still in use in parts of South China until recently, and the phylogenetic analysis tells us that this is the draw loom's closest relative. The patterning system consists of sets of cords which record warp lifts, 
visible behind the assistant at the top left. Each chord records one warp lift, corresponding to one line in the design. And each warp has only two positions, up or down, so the information is encoded in binary form. The set of pattern chords is gradually rotated around the loom as the pattern unfolds. The origin of this part of the loom is more mysterious, but it's unlikely that, ap that it appeared in this lineage fully formed, particularly as there are no intermediate forms that survive. Instead, it seems to be another example of borrowing. The most likely source of this patterning technology is the looms with similar rotating patterning systems in South China, such as this one that we looked at earlier. There's a great variety in these patterning systems with varying degrees of complexity. In these looms, the lines in the design are encoded by sticks rather than cords, but the basic principle of operation is the same. The most astonishing feature of the phylogeny that we looked at earlier is that it connects the draw loom, which is perhaps the most complex device in the pre-modern world, to its origins in ground looms that began in the late Neolithic period. Finally, as food for thought, I want to leave you with a suggestion. The suggestion is this, that analyses like this one are giving us nothing less than an alternative way of viewing history. Most written histories tend to be linear narratives, perhaps because we have a natural disposition to prefer stories which are written in this way, and also because we are attracted by change and novelty. Certainly, if we're writing a biography, for example, this form makes sense. It's often the preferred form for accounts of technology, too, which tend to emphasize triumphal progress towards the most advanced computer, mobile phone, steam engine, or whatever. But as we've seen, real history does not unfold in this way. Real history is nonlinear, diverse, and follows multiple branching pathways. It involves long periods of stasis, which don't attract much attention, but which are interesting in their own right. As I mentioned at the start of this video, the writer Georges-Louis Borges envisaged something similar in his story The Garden of Forking Paths. I think that Borges' idea, which has intrigued and tantalized storytellers ever since, is a much better metaphor for human history. That's the thought I'm going to leave you with, and that's the end of these three videos discussing the evolution of culture. If you've made it this far, thanks for listening.